everybody. So, um, yes, that's right. One, one more announcement. Really, I guess, just a, a call to continue to pray. Uh, for those of you guys, I think everybody in the church probably has heard by this point that we're just taking time to pray about our relationship to this building. So this is a, a space that we've met, met in for Sundays, for Sunday worship for well, probably over a decade now. Um, but we don't own it, and we're praying about whether or not we should stay here or look for another space. And that's an important decision because as a congregation, we have a real intentional relationship to our neighborhood and um, even to this building and felt like God directed us here in the first place. And so we're just praying and seeking God's wisdom about that. So please continue to do that. I'm just going to take a moment right now and ask God to speak to us. Also, many of you guys have taken a moment to send a text or an email to me or to talk to other leaders in the church, and I just continue to encourage you to do that. Um, you know, as I said last week, God speaks to some of you in dreams and visions and to others in spreadsheets, and, and uh, <laughs> so however God speaks to you, great, but share, share that. So God, we just pray that you would lead us as you have. We trust you, we want to be your people, and we want to be where you want us to be. And so if that's in this building on Sundays, great. If it's somewhere else, great. Uh, we just pray for your leadership and your guidance and your wisdom uh, and your faithfulness as you have always been faithful. And we pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're continuing on in our series in Luke. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 3 today, picking it up after uh, where Pastor Mark left us last week. And um, well, that's the wrong, sorry, I'm setting a timer here. I'm tr trying to keep track of how long I preach. Um, that's for your sake, not mine, I promise. But, um, uh, and I almost opened my, my camera and took a picture of everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so we're, we're in Luke chapter 3. And again, just a reminder that Luke's gospel really, th there are kind of two big themes uh, of Luke's gospel. And and encouragement to all of you to dig into Luke. We're, we're going to be in Luke for a long time because uh, it's a long book, so dig into it. But the, the two major themes of the gospel of Luke, first is that Luke is tying in the story of Jesus and the story of what God is doing in and through Jesus to the broader story of the whole scripture, the whole story of what God has done in and through his people and his own activity on the earth as God's dealing with the problem of human sin and brokenness. And so really, Luke is continuing to tell this story, not just as the story of Jesus, but the story of Jesus as the story of God addressing the problem of human brokenness that has uh, plagued human beings for all of human history, right? And so it's just this connection to this broader story of God at work. But also, again and again and again, we see Luke telling the story of, and again, this is, this is continuing a theme, but of Jesus bringing in those people from the outside, people who weren't really supposed to be on the inside, and yet those are exactly the people that God wants to bring in. And so that's another major theme of Luke that, that we'll see uh, time and again. So just a reminder to be paying attention to those things as we're reading through Luke. Um, and I want to tell a story before I jump into the text, just as a, as a primer. Um, I don't know if I've shared this story with you. And as a preacher, one of the dangers is I tell the same stories over and over and over again. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> tell me your stories and, and I'll share them. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell a story about repentance. Anybody want to share? Uh, we are talking about repentance this morning. So I was probably 17 years old, my senior in high school. I was raised in a Christian home. Um, and had lots of good Bible teaching, and, and I would say genuine faith. But by the time I was 17 years old, I was a mess spiritually, um, doing a lot of, the, at the root of it was rebellion aimed at my father, which is fitting on Father's Day, right, to share that story. But that led to, you know, sexual sin and drug and alcohol abuse and just all, all sorts of problem, problems with the law. And uh, so the summer after I graduated high school, before I went off to college, my parents said, we'll let you stay here if you promise to go to church every week and go to AA every week. So those were the requirements for me at 17 to stay in my parents' home. So I was going to uh, one of the large churches in our, in our hometown, their youth group, and had this really crazy encounter with God where, you know, I'm in the back. And again, just to set the stage, I was a probably, arguably, one of the most successful athletes to come out of my town, at least in my age group. So that meant that I thought I was hot stuff, right? 
Um, I also actually wasn't very good with people, so that meant I wasn't actually that popular, which kind of put a chip on my shoulder. So I'm like really attuned to like how people see me, right? Um, so I'm in this room, some preachers up front talking about repentance and God's holiness. There's worship, and I'm just really maybe for the first time in my life coming face to face with the fact that I am just a sinful person, right? Which I would imagine everybody in the room has had that moment in your life. And I know I'm supposed to go up front in front of, you know, 100, 200 high school, my, my peers, and I'm, you know, covered in tears and snot. And I know I'm supposed to go up there. I don't want to go up there because, you know, <laughs> I have an image to protect. Uh, but I do. I go up front. I'm on my face before the altar. I'm, you know, crying. I'm not the only person. Uh, people are praying for me. And um, it's this really powerful moment, right? But I share that story because it actually is not a story of repentance. It's a very powerful moment. It's one that I look back on. But I got up off the floor and I went right back to my life. Nothing changed at all. It wasn't for several years later that I actually had a moment. And it, was, it wasn't in the temple. <laughs> for, for the purposes of our story, it wasn't in the temple. It was out in the desert. It wasn't in a church. It was actually in a locker room. Right, some years later, where God actually got a hold of me in a way that led to me choosing to repent. So I share that story as just a primer for what we're about to read. Um, so if you want, you can turn with me to Luke chapter three. And um, I forgot exactly where we're picking it up. I think verse seven is where Mark left us. Yes. So we we read um, verse one through seven. Um, you know sets the stage of uh, just kind of what's going on in the nation and the, the, the people who have official leadership. And then w- the, the Luke focuses in on John the Baptist, who's out in the middle of nowhere. And that's where the word of the Lord comes, is to John, not to the kings or the, the quote-unquote high priests in, in the temple, but to John out in the desert. And the, the word of Isaiah is specifically pointed at as this prophetic picture of who John is, the one who is called by God to prepare the way for God to come and to be with his people. And then we pick it up in verse 7, and we'll read on. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? How's that to start a sermon? What would you guys do if I started sermons that way? (laughs) Spawn of the devil. Who invited you here? All right. Yeah, that's wild. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So they respond actually with faith to that message. And I think this is part of the evidence that this is in fact the word of God speaking to John and through John because a message like that, if it's not inspired by God, would probably lead lots of people to just leave. But instead, it's this prophetic holy moment where John is speaking exactly what the people need to hear and their hearts are ready to hear it. And you can tell because they respond in verse 10 by saying, what should we do then? Right? The crowd asked this, and John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Okay, pretty straightforward. We can maybe handle that. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to. Hmm, okay. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. I think we can manage that, Right? Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Okay, right? I think that's manageable. But what these things point at, and again, we're going to come back to this idea of fruit towards the end of this morning's message. They're not, these, these aren't actually that hard, right? These aren't heavy lifts. And yet what they are is they are evidence of someone whose heart has genuinely responded to God's call. 
right? That's what they are, and that's what that word fruit means, right? Fruit is on a tree. You, you know the tree is alive because it's producing fruit, right? You know that it's healthy because there's fruit there, and that's, that's really what John is saying. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. He's not saying superhuman fruit. He's not saying be the saintliest saint who ever lived. He's saying just show with your life that your heart has genuinely sought after God in this moment. Produce, and as I shared just that opening story. It wasn't repentance. There was zero fruit in my life from that moment, or at least not until years later where I would point at this moment of, of true repentance, true choosing on my part that then actually began to produce. And the fruit was small early on in my life, right? It was, it was this kind of fruit. Uh, you know, the, I think the first fruit in my life was not even not swearing. It was just trying not to swear. That was like the first fruit of repentance in Steve's life is trying not to drop the F word every other sentence. Just trying, not, not succeeding, right? But that's genuine fruit, right? It's real fruit of real repentance. So this is our text this morning. This is what we're looking at. And um, you can put the next slide up. So we're going we're gonna to focus in on John. This is my attempt to, this, does that look like a good John the Baptist prophet picture, right? I love all the icons of John. See, so like the, you know, the like paintings where people are like kind of nice and proper. And then the one with John is always, his hair is going everywhere. And I, I like those pictures. Because um, that's John the Baptist, right? Guy living out in the middle of nowhere. But there's this interesting juxtaposition between, uh, it's not necessarily in our text, but in, in Mark's text last week. You know, you've got all of these kings, and then you've got the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, who... Uh, as, as Mark shared last week, they, they were appointed by Rome, right? These were Roman high priests. And really, there's, there's even people who would argue. So, so Luke points out that John is descended from the high priestly line on both sides, mother and father, right? And John is certainly functioning in this prophetic role. But, but Luke is actually suggesting that, okay, so you've got Annas and Caiaphas. The Romans have selected them to serve as the high priest, but they're not the real high priest, Right? The, the word of God is not found in the palace. It's not found in the temple. It's out in the desert with John. And John is the prophet, but maybe perhaps he's also the true high priest, the, the one that God has actually selected to represent him to the people and to represent the people to him, to stand in that place. Right? And John is the one who has been given the word to prepare the way for Jesus, who will become the ultimate high priest. Right? The high priest that is the only high priest who is himself not in need of forgiveness, right? But John is kind of like the last high priest pointing at the great eternal high priest who is Jesus, right? And so this is, this is John the Baptist. And uh, the scriptures, again, from, from last week's passage, characterizes John's message as he is preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, Right, which we heard the content. I don't know if that's how you would describe <laughs> the sermon that I read to you as, oh, that's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But that's how Luke describes the content of John's message. And um, we're going to dig into this idea of repentance. But I also want to point out that the, the whole thing is about this invitation to forgiveness right? This invitation to a right relationship with God where the things that stand between us and God have been forgiven, have been done away with, the breach has been repaired, the, the alienation between humans and God has been dealt with by God himself, right? That's actually what John is preaching to people, that this is what's coming. God wants to forgive you. Do you want him to forgive you? If you do, then repent, turn to him, ask him to do so, and he will. And so there's this interesting, you know, God is calling John and telling John that he wants to forgive his people, but there's this, there's God's part and there's our part, right? God's part is sending John. God's part is offering forgiveness and healing and redemption and salvation. Our part is the repentance. Our part is the choosing, the saying yes, Right? And then the fruit that comes after that really in many ways is what God does in us. And so I want to talk a little bit about, um, actually, yeah, you can put up the next slide. 
All right. I'm not going to explain that yet. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, so today's Father's Day, right? And I want to talk a little bit about this idea of God as a father. And as Pastor Gail said, you know, we've, we've all got, every one of us in here has a father. Maybe you never met your dad. Maybe you hate your dad. Maybe you wish you never met your dad. Maybe you love your dad. Maybe you're in, ex, ex, exceedingly grateful for your dad, right? And we all have different relationships to our earthly fathers, uh, but this is a metaphor that God continues to use for himself in Scripture. But also God uses the metaphor of mother for himself in Scripture, right? Do I, do I dare say herself? I don't know. <laughs> but, but God actually does, right? Now, the, 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 the word father is almost the, the preeminent term that God uses for himself in Scripture. There are others, king or shepherd. or like. There's lots of metaphors that are used of God in Scripture. But mother is also one of them, right? There's... Um, yeah, we're going to read this in Luke, thir Luke 13. Jesus himself, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Right? Jesus talks about himself in motherly terms, wanting to mother the people of Israel, but they wouldn't accept it. Right? In uh, Isaiah 49, this is actually a really special verse to me because it been spoken over me prophetically a few times in some really key moments, but um, God says to his people, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have carved you on the palms of my hands. And again, God uses this image of a mother, nurse, a nursing mother with a newborn infant and says, yeah, this is what I am like towards you, even more so, even more compassionate even more are you present in my heart and in my mind than a nursing mother. And so I think on Father's Day, it's appropriate to talk about God as a father. And, and again, in light of the, the fact that God, in many ways, reveals himself as a father, it's appropriate to do that. But God also talks about this mothering, compassionate role in nature that he has. Um, but I think that, and again, I'm going to talk in gender stereotypes be warned, don't be offended or shocked, right? Uh, gender stereotypes exist because men and women are generally different. That doesn't mean all men or all women or all fathers or all mothers. All right, caveat. Everybody good? We cool? Okay, all right. So uh, moms tend to be nurturers, right? That is that is that motherly role, and that's exactly what you know. God continues to reveal himself as compassionate and nurturing. Fathers tend to have expectations on their children, right? And there is healthy nurturing and unhealthy nurturing. There is healthy expectation and unhealthy expectation, right? Um, and so, in, as a matter of fact, that's in, in Ephesians 6, right? This is so, so if the role of a father is to say to a son or a daughter, you can be more, you can be powerful, you can be capable, I know that you will grow up to make your mark on the world. If that's the true role of a father is to, to say that. That's that like fathering role in a child's life. Uh, the, the dark side of that is you'll never live up to my expectations, right? That's the dark side. And uh, Ephesians 6 says exactly this. Fathers, don't exasperate your children, right? Another one says don't provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, right? So there is this call, and again, this is both moms and dads together, um, but there's this, this call to actually put expectations on our kids, to say, I, I expect you to live up to the call of God on your life. I expect you to be a man or a woman of integrity. I want that for you. I believe in that for you, right? That's, that's a part of what it means to be a parent, just as it's also to say, I will feed you, and I will clothe you, and I will care for you, and I will always be here for you, and you will always be my son or my daughter, right? And both of those things are important. Both of those things can get twisted and out of whack, and that's why oftentimes, you know, two parents or for, for people who are raising kids alone, a community of people can help to provide that balanced approach to parenting, right? We talked about that a few weeks ago. And so that kind of gets at this, right? So the, the social psychologist would use the terms agency and communion for what I'm talking about in fathering and mothering, right? A father wants to provide agency to his kids. You can do it. You are an agent. You are an actor. You can accomplish things in the world. I expect, because I see what you are capable of, I expect you to live up 
to what you are capable of, right? And that's something that's hard. That's hard to have. It's also glorious to have. How many of you can think, of, whether it's your own father or your mother or a coach or a teacher or a pastor or a mentor who you were in a tough spot and they looked you in the eye and they said, you can do hard things. You can do this thing, whatever it is. You know, uh, take responsibility for your mistakes. Do something physically demanding. Work a couple of extra hours to accomplish what you want to accomplish, whatever it is, right? And, and those are the places in our lives where we, we grow and we, we become who God is calling us to become. And so that's really important, right? And again, that can get twisted. It can go sideways. Um, I never do that though, right? <laughs> What's the, I think we were in the car yesterday and uh, I was referred to as a tyrant. Is that the word? <laughs> I, I wasn't being a tyrant yesterday, but I, they, there was some people. Uh, side, I have a tyrant side. All right, so next time, just say, Father, don't exasperate your children, right? Yes. So again, that's uh, I lost I lost my train of thought there, but you guys you guys got the point. And yeah, that is so. That's a part of also what the church is called to be, right? Is that again, if you're well, I mean, I had a great father, great dad. Um, he did all of the important things right. I think he did all of the less important things wrong, <laughs> but he did all the important things right, you know? So he, I mean, he, he wrestled with, he, he would be the first to say that he wrestled with anger. He didn't have a father. He had pretty hard life. And so for him, getting that mix right was hard. But one of the things, I mean, this is one of the things that, uh, that he modeled for me, right? Both on both sides of this equation. He was one of the, the people in my life who looked me in the eye and said, you could do this. Dad, this is hard. I don't want to do it. You could do it. And a lot of that happened in the realm of sports for me. That was a big part of my life and where I learned to do hard things, but not just in sports, in, you know, <laughs> school, relationships. Yeah, that's hard. But son, this is how you have to handle that. This is how you have, have to deal with a bully in your school. It's, it's not going to be easy, but this is how you approach that. This is the decision you have to make. And so to have you know, a man in my life who is telling me, this is the hard thing that you have to do, but I think you are capable of doing it, was incredibly powerful. But also, on the flip side, one of the things, and this is where you can put the next slide up. Uh, so the other side of, of the coin, and this is typically thought of as like the mothering, nurturing role, and again, the social psychologist would use the term communion, right? Is that like desire to bond with and to connect with and to have intimacy with your children or you know, the people that you're in relationship with. And this also, too, is something my mom, but also my father, modeled for me. One of the things that I recall is, I don't know, it's was probably six or seven years old, and I remember this specific instance, but I, maybe it had happened before, where my dad had blew up at me. Um, I'm in my room crying or upset or whatever, and my dad comes in, knocks on the door, sits down sheepish, and says, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have done that. You know, you, what you did was wrong. I needed to address that. But the way that I handled myself was totally inappropriate. And I'm sorry, son, will you forgive me, right? And to have a father in my life do that for me was incredibly powerful, right? I mean, I don't know how much I felt the power of it in, in the moment. But over the years as I've grown up, to have a father who cared for me and nurtured me in that way and desired to have that with me was incredibly powerful, right? And so, again, we have a God who is desires both of those things. We have a God who desires to see our relationship restored, who wants communion and intimacy with us. But we also have a God who is saying to us, you are capable of being more. I've created you to be powerful and good. I've, you know, bare minimum, be content with your pay and don't steal things, right? Like I expect things of you, right? And so this is, this is a part of the way that God is relating to us. And so we see, again, the word of the Lord to John is this, this message of baptism, of cleansing, of preparation as a sign of repentance and a sign of God's forgiveness in our lives in preparation for Jesus who is coming to restore and to redeem and to offer uh, forgiveness. And so, hmm, I missed the passage I was going to read. I think that the, the point is lost. Um, but again, I, I think I said this two weeks ago, uh, Hebrews 11 and 12, 
Good stuff. You guys should dig into that. Uh, there's some great, just kind of, like, the, the author of Hebrews points at a lot of what we're talking about this morning. So I won't, I won't read it to you. You can, you can do, can I assign homework? Is that okay? You guys read the Bible, yeah? No? <laughs> if you don't, you should start with Hebrews 11 and 12. All right, so where were we? I shared that, I shared that. All right, next slide. So, so I want to focus in on repentance because in many ways that's the, um, the heart of what what John is saying is this idea of repentance. And, you know, we talked earlier about God's part and our part, right? God's part is sending John, is sending the, the is calling people to repentance. God's part is also um, providing forgiveness, saying to us, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to hold that against you. Come back. Be in relationship with me, right? And so there's God's part, but there's also our part. Our part is the choosing. Our part is the repenting. Our part is the coming into relationship with God. And so really, this is something that requires us to be involved in, but it's also something that really is about God doing, right? And there's lots of these places, lots of passages in scripture that point to, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God that works in you to will and to act, right? You do all the work to figure out how to be saved because it's actually God that's working in you to both want and to do the things that he's calling you to do, right? That's what that passage says. Well, so who's doing what? Is it God? Is it us? It's both, right? And so there's God's part and our part that come together so often in scripture, so often in our lives. And I think like a picture of a dancing couple, there's a great image of what it's like to be people who partner with God to see, first and foremost, just salvation come to us, but also to be a part of the work that he's calling us to do in this world, right? What is it that God is calling us to do? He's calling us to partner with him to share a message or to pray for somebody or to serve somebody. Who's at work? Is it Steve or is it God? Well, the answer is it's both oftentimes, right? And so there is God's part and there is our part that come together. And so I think this, this, this picture of, you know, two people dancing is a great picture of what this, this call that John is putting forward is, this call to ba baptism for both repentance and forgiveness looks like. And so it's, you know, again, it's both agency and communion coming together. It's both truth and love coming together. It's God saying, I want to be with you. I want to be in relationship with you. But also, I want you to be everything that I've dreamed you could be. I want you to be as good and as powerful and as glorious as I've always seen you to be, right? This is, this is what is going on here. But also maybe another metaphor for repentance. This is a picture of my son <laughs> jackhammering some concrete steps. Uh, this is, I don't know how many, how, this is like three or four years ago, something like that. Is it more than that? Yeah. You're, you're better at stuff like that. Details, is that what they're called? Uh, is that, is that, did, did, I, did I make a funny? All right. Anybody who's ever worked with me knows I'm not good at details. Um, right. Last week, I had this really cool moment. I was sitting next to my daughter while Mark was preaching, and again, he was talking a bit about repentance, because that's that was in last week's passage as well, and um, he's talking about repentance, and what it is, and how it works, and I'm watching Zoe. She has a, a knitting project. I didn't ask if I could share this story, but don't worry. It's not emotional, or personal, or anything. It's just a, I could, I could have used somebody else as an example, but I was watching her. Um, she was knitting something, like, I, I, I'm not, I don't know anything about knitting, so, probably, probably, were you knitting or crocheting? Yeah, see, she was crocheting. This is another one of those details. Anyway, she was crocheting uh, something going into, I think, a blanket or something, but what she was doing, she wasn't taking it out of just a ball of yarn. She was actually undoing another project while she was, and pulling the, the yarn out of this other project that she decided she didn't like to make, um, to make a blanket. And I'm listening to Mark preaching about repentance while I'm watching her do this. And I was like, oh, that's, that's what that is. Yeah, the preacher in the room's like, that's good. Yeah, I don't, you just take that one. Yeah, just take that one. Yeah, you can tell the story about Ryan crocheting. From <laughs> 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 I was watching my son crochet. And 
<laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Ryan's like, please don't say that ever again. Um, anyway, but that's, that's this picture of what repentance is. And so this, again, this is a picture of, so we had these steps that were just not in good shape. And it's like, well, what do we do? You tear them out and you put some new steps in. Right? And so repentance is also like that. As much as repentance is like choosing your dance partner, saying, you know, who am I dancing with? Am I dancing alone? Am I dancing with the devil? I don't know. Who am I dancing with? Right? No, I, like, I'm going to choose God. I, I, yeah, I know that was really cheesy. Sorry. For everybody who <laughs> groaned on the inside, I just thought of it in the moment and went with it. Um, Boy, I could tell you some stories about Pastor Mike and Redding. He, he had some doozies. No, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but so repentance in, in some ways, like that metaphor of choosing your dance partner, of saying, I'm going to choose to dance. I'm going to choose to relate to God, to allow him to be the one that I work with. That's a, a great picture of repentance. But so is recognizing something is present that shouldn't be present and tearing it out and starting over again. Right? That's also a picture of repentance, and but both of those get at the fact that there is a choice for us to make. As much as God is God, God in his sovereignty has allowed us to also have a small bit of sovereignty, a small bit of choice in our lives and in this world, and that choice actually matters. Right? Our choices have consequences, particularly our choice to choose God or not has consequences, and this is this call, call to repentance. Uh, and, you know, C.S. Lewis, he, he pretty famously said that um, repentance is not just hard. Repentance is like death. Right? And that's um, probably all of us. You're probably all going, yep, that's true. <laughs> I know exactly what that's like. Uh, and, that, you know, again, wh- that's why it was so powerful for me as a young boy to have my father come into the room and say to me, I offended you. I sinned against you and I'm sorry. Forgive me. Because what he did was he, he embraced that death of repentance for my sake, right? And he modeled that for me. And so that then becomes this incredibly powerful act, but it's this, this powerful choosing that we're invited into. Again, it's hard, but it's also something that is, the, it's the only way. Again, as C.S. Lewis says, we might wish that God would take us back without making us repent because repenting is so hard, but repentance is the path back to God. So asking God to take us back without repenting would be like asking God to take us back without taking us back. All right, it's just, that's just not how it works. And so this is the path to forgiveness. This is why John is saying something like brood of vipers who invited you to the party. And really what he's saying is he even goes on to say, right, you might claim to be children of Abraham. God can raise up children of Abraham from the stones, right? You're children of snakes. So repent. And and what he's essentially saying is just because you are biological children doesn't make you the heir, right? That's That's not how the heir gets selected. Now, most parents select their biological children as their heirs, usually, not always. (laughs) You could lose that thing. That's bad news. The good news is just because you're not biological children doesn't mean you're not the heirs, right? And that is absolutely the good news of the gospel and the message that we see through the, 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 the gospel of Luke, right, is that Jesus is in the business of saying to children who are not the biological children, you're adopted in and you're heirs of God. Come in. And so this is what John is pointing at. Produce fruit in keeping with, like, this is serious business. Choose God as your father because this has real consequences. And uh, I want to talk finally, the last thing this morning is about fruit. And... um, I worked really hard to come up with not a sports metaphor for you guys. <laughs> I, well, I'll, it was either sports or money, and I was like, I don't really want to do money. That doesn't feel right. So I went with an Academy Award. Is that okay? Oscars are all right. So again, this idea of fruit. So obviously there are ways of knowing you're a good actress 
that don't involve an Academy Award, but if you win an Oscar, you're probably a pretty good actress, right? Is that fair, right? This is a sign that you're pretty good at your job. And so that's, that's why we've got a picture of Halle Berry winning an Oscar up there. Um, so, you know, you could, you, could, you could quibble over whether or not she was the best actress that year, but you're not going to argue that she was a pretty good one that year, right? She, she, she did a good job. And that's, that's this picture of fruit that we see John pointing at, is producing fruit in keeping with repentance. It's like, okay, if these things are present in your life, then you know that there's something going on in your heart. You know that there's something going on in your relationship with God. And I actually want to use this to do a jumping off point. This is, I have no idea how well this will work for you guys this morning. Um, so we're going we're to talk a little bit about the quote-unquote strategic plan of the Buffalo Vineyard Church. So if you're like, oh boy, this doesn't sound like fun at all. Or if, this does, if the plane doesn't land, my apologies, but I'm going to try it anyway. So I'm going to pass this out. Uh, let me turn this off so I don't. Um, so this is something, some of you guys are probably really familiar with this. A lot of you guys, maybe you've never seen it before. Um, if you're a visitor, I promise this will still be helpful, right? It's not going to be, um, it's not going to be boring. We're we're not, we're not looking at spreadsheets. I I swear. So these, these sit on the back table and I would encourage you to take this one home with you. Um, and we'll, we'll print out more, but what this is, is this is just what we, what we dream about what we're committed to doing, right? Really in a nutshell, what we dream about and what we're committed to doing. And on the front page, this, this side here where it's got all those icons and it says strategic plan, I'm not gonna dig into that too much. Um, but you know, at the top, you've got a vision statement that really is just what we believe God is calling us to work towards, what we dream about, what we hope for, right? What we're living towards. And underneath that are these values that really make up that vision, right? So we value the kingdom of God. We value mysticism. We value the spirit of God coming and doing strange things in our lives, right? Showing up at work. Uh, One of the things, you know, that we could point at even just in light of this passage this morning, is this idea of deliverance ministry, asking God's spirit to set us free from evil. This is what John came to promise, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. God wants to show up and set you free. Right? This, is, this is what this looks like. Right? So those are kind of like the, 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 like the, the aspirational side of, of what we stand for as a church. And then underneath that, you've got a mission statement right? that gets talked about every single Sunday, we talk about how what we are about as a church is teaching people the way of King Jesus, right? Regularly encountering God, training each other in the faith, and effectively serving our neighbors. That's a statement of action. This is what we do. And underneath that are these five strategies of the ways that as a people, we do that. We show up on Sundays, we gather together in small groups, we're finding ways to serve our neighbors and share our faith with them. We're, you know, participating in the family chores, taking care of the things that are needed. We're engaged as, as disciples in personal discipleship, right? So those are the things that we do. So that's just kind of a brief overview for you. But what I want to do is point you to the backside. And this is something that our leadership team, we've prayed about and talked about over the last probably six to eight months. And we've talked about doing this for a while, but over the last six to eight months, we actually did the work of coming up with this list of fruit. Right, and so what we mean, so if you're more of like a business-minded person, this would be like the outcomes, right? <laughs> if you guys are familiar with, uh, so Jesus tells the parable of the, the lost coin, the lost son, and the lost sheep, right? And he concludes each of those with, I tell you the truth, just like this person threw a party, the angels in heaven throw a party every time one sinner repent, repents right? He said, he, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, right? But that's why he's telling those stories. And what Jesus is saying is, this is the fruit that matters to God. And in fact, he's having an argument with some Pharisees about why he's doing some, you know, why are you hanging out with those sinners? And what he's saying to them is, you're measuring the wrong things as success. Let me tell you what God measures as success. Let me tell you when God throws a party. Let me tell you the fruit that God counts. Let me tell you what God considers an Oscar or an Academy Award. Let me tell you who God thinks is a good actress or whatever, right? Let me give you God's standard of success. That's what Jesus is saying. And so it's important for us to be able to do that, to say, well, what counts? How do we know if we're actually living out the faith of you know, the, the, the life that God has called us to. And so as a, as a leadership team, we put this list together. 
And so I'm just going to read it to you guys uh, as a way of saying, as a church, this is what we believe counts. This is what we should throw parties about. This is what we should ask God for. This is what we should celebrate when it happens. Is that fair? So even if you're not a part of our church, hopefully this is helpful, right? Cool. So this is the fruit that we've laid out. First of all, that people in our church are having mystical encounters with God in all areas of life. Holy cow, the Spirit of God showed up. <laughs> oh my gosh, God just did something, right? At work, at home, at school, on a Sunday morning, in a small group, at the farm, right? Having, like, we're on holy ground moments, okay? Mentoring each other for kingdom living and kingdom leadership, right? That somebody in your life is helping you grow as a follower of Christ and that you're in somebody's life helping them grow as a follower of Christ, right? That, that's fruit. That's something that counts. That's something that we want to celebrate, that we believe that the angels in heaven are throwing a party over. That people in our church are experiencing forgiveness, recovery, healing, and freedom. All right, so if that's you, if you are like, let me tell you how I am, how, how long I've been clean from alcohol, or how I was forgiven or have forgiven somebody. That's a God story. I want to hear about it. We should celebrate that, right? I'm free from the power of sin in this area of my life. Man, stand up and testify, right? Because God is celebrating that. When people are actively engaged in our five strategies, right? When people are showing up and participating in the life of the body, that's something we want to celebrate that we believe is fruit. When people are taking risks and trying new things that produce spiritual growth, for some of us, this is like, yeah. And for others, it's like, oh, dear God, no. But for all of us, this is, right, that we're, uh, for those of you guys who aren't familiar, John Wimber was the founder of the Vineyard Movement. And he used to famously say, how do you spell faith? And then the answer is R-I-S-K is how you spell faith, right? So we want to be risky people, risk-taking people in the right ways. Um, yeah, the fruit of... God in our church would be that we're, as a people, we're solving problems plaguing our city and our world. Small problems, but uh, there's, there's this family that should have an apartment. Let's solve that problem, because that's a problem. We should solve it. Yeah, that's God at work in and through. That, that counts, right? That's fruit, okay? Um, proclaiming and demonstrating the love of Jesus that leads to people entering the kingdom, that we're sharing both in word and deed, the truth of who God is, and people are responding by coming into relationship with Jesus, right? That we're participating, that we, us, you, are participating in relationships that cross social divisions, and that we're welcoming the residents of our zip code into our church, right? That's fruit. When somebody shows up and they're like, man, let me tell you how I got loved into this church from across the street. That's a story we want to tell. That's fruit, right? Um, that we are giving time, talent, treasure, and prayer to each other, to our congregation as a whole, to the farm, and to our local partners here in the city and our global partners around the world, that we're sharing our resources freely, right? That's, that's fruit. That counts. That's, that's an Oscar, or maybe that goes in, maybe, I don't know if it's an Oscar, but because there's only one Oscar, but you get it, right? Uh, and then finally, this, this is something that points at just kind of the health of the church as a whole, that, that we are a congregation that has healthy and sustainable leadership and healthy and sustainable finances, right? That we have uh, a team of leaders that are, you know, not burnt out or hating each other, or hating what we do, that we have a financial model where we're being, you know, wise stewards of the way that we both take in money and spend it. Right? So these are the things that we are pointing at as a leadership team that we're saying this is fruit. This is how we know that we are actually living into our vision and living out our mission, that we're doing what we're supposed to do and moving towards the dream that God has for us. So if you, if you are like, this is a dumb list, please come and talk to me afterwards. That's fine. We can have that conversation. Um, but hopefully this is encouraging. And more than anything else, I think doing the work of being able to say, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're working towards. This is what matters. This is what counts. Should hopefully for all of us, I know I look at a list like this and it's helpful for me to say, oh, when we talk about, you know, showing up on Sunday morning, 
This is what we're hoping might happen. When we talk about participating in a small group, this is what we're hoping might happen. When we're talking about serving at the farm or you know, going to work as a school teacher because I feel like that's my calling in life or being a stay-at-home mother because I feel like that's my calling in life. Yeah, this is what we're hoping will happen is these things, that these are the things that we believe will come out of God's call in our lives and our faithful response to that. Does that make sense? All right, so hopefully that was, did the plane land okay? Was it rocky? I don't know. And then now we're going to transition to communion, all right? So, um, and man, yeah, com- so communion is communion, right? God, God wants to be intimate with you. And that's, you know, th- this, this picture, uh, it's not a picture, it's this, this ritual, this, this meal, this a- like acted out picture, this acted out ritual that we're invited to do week in and week out as God's people. It points at exactly that that God desires to be with you and to be with me, to invite you to be with him. He wants to share his life with you such that you take it into yourself as food, as sustenance. He wants to share a meal with you. He wants to build a community with you, right? These are all of these pictures that are present in this meal that Jesus modeled and then invited us to participate in as a, as a sign, as a remembrance of what he has done for us, but also what he has accomplished for us, right? So what he did was broken body, shed blood, but what he earned for us, what he accomplished for us is life and food and communion with God as our father and with each other as brothers and sisters, right? And so that's what this this meal is a, a picture of, which, you know, maybe that doesn't line up with the fruit part of my sermon, but it definitely lines up with the John the Baptist saying, hey, repentance and forgiveness, that's at the heart of this. Turn to God, experience deliverance, step into life with him, receive it, all right? So we're going we're gonna to take communion. Um, so I'll invite you guys to come up and to take the elements. We've got gluten, gluten-free and gluten, so you guys can grab whatever you need to grab there. But I'll invite you to come up and grab that and return to your seats. Um, but just as we're doing this, may, maybe there's a place of repentance that God is calling you to. Or maybe there's a place uh, where you've repented but don't feel forgiven, I don't know, maybe there's, there's just something there that you want to identify, right? To say, okay, this is a place where God is calling me to choose him or to reject, you know, to tear, tear out the old steps and build the new ones. Or, but what are the places where God is putting his finger on something in your heart this morning? And I would just invite you to be mindful of that and then to begin talking to God about that as we come up and, and grab the elements and return to our seats and then I lead you in communion. So you can come on up and grab that and return to your seat. So if there is something specific that God has highlighted for you as a place of repentance, 
um, yeah, just, you know, you don't have to do this out loud, but I would invite you to just tell God you repent. Tell him you're choosing him. Tell him, tell him what you're choosing and what you're rejecting. So if that's you, I just give you a moment to say that to God now. We thank you, Lord, that you call us to repentance, not because you hate us, but because you love us. And you know how hard it is because you have paid the price of repentance for us. Maybe for some of you in the room, there's a place where you need forgiveness or don't feel forgiven. And I just want to say to you, you are forgiven. And I don't say that because I'm a nice guy. I say that because I actually am standing on the authority of Scripture. Those aren't my words. Those are God's words. And you can know that they're true because Jesus died on a cross. So you are forgiven. Again, those are not my words. Those are words spoken with the authority of Jesus. You are forgiven of your sins. So again, Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he called his friends together for a meal and he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he passed it and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Eat it and remember me. And in the same way, he took the, the wine and he said, this is blood. It's my blood. Blood shed for you. Blood of the new covenant, the new agreement, the new deal between God and his people. Take it and drink it. Why don't we stand? Again, just an invitation and a reminder if God is pointing at something this morning that requires you to respond, then respond, right? God invites, we respond, uh, and that response could look like anything. Maybe you know exactly what God wants you to do, go do it. Maybe you don't, but you want to do something, ask for prayer, right? Come see me, one of our prayer team leaders, the person you walked in the door with, and ask them to just pray with you and to seek God with you, okay? Well, Lord, I thank you for the men and the women in this room. I thank you that you love them. I thank you that you desire to be with them. I also thank you, God, for the expectation that you have on them. That you have a dream and a plan for each one of these people. And again, God has expectations for your life. He has dreams for your life. He has a calling that he's placed on each one of you. And it's there because God knows that you are capable of it. It requires repentance, it requires faith, it requires the Spirit of God, it requires the Scriptures, it requires God's people to come alongside you, but you are capable of living up to the call of God on your life. So God, I pray that you would pour your Spirit out on your people. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Go in peace.